Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your vengeful hosts. I am John. And I'm CC. And when there's just too much cool anime to watch, we've got you covered. As a sophisticated man once said, the number of the day is two. Because today we will discuss the second season of both Megalobox and Zombieland Saga. So first I will take a look at what our favorite underdog boxer Gillis Joe has been up to in Nomad. And after that John will fill us in on the new misadventures of our favorite underdog idols from French Shushu in Zombieland Saga Revenge. <laughs> <laughs> so get ready to throw some fists and hurl your undead bodies into the roadblocks on the way to success. And definitely don't pause the pod, we'll be right back. Okay, the second season of Megalobox, which has been titled Nomad. Yeah, so this is gonna be his continued series review, so spoilers for Megalobox season 1 and 2, of course, full spoilers thing. And yeah, where did we leave off at the end of season 1? A pretty happy place, kinda, kinda, because Joe obviously won the Megalomania, uh, Meg Megalomania? Megalonia? Megalonia tournament. <clears throat> See, Megalomania, that's, uh... Close enough. <laughs> you you want to talk to Toby Fox about that? Maybe, maybe. But no, <laughs> Megalonia, um, the big Megalobox tournament, where he beat his, his destined rival, uh, Yuri, uh, in the finals. And it looked, at the like, at the end of the season, this would be the start of a great career him working together with uh, with his coach Nambu and all the basically the orphan kids they accumulated and added to their uh, boxing dojo basically so i was a bit surprised when at the beginning of season two joe seems to be in a pretty shitty place <laughs> he apparently went back to doing underground boxing megalo boxing not doing the official stuff anymore just doing it in the semi illegal thing i don't even know how that works but it's kind of like illegal betting and everything and uh is doing that again and apparently he's addicted to painkillers and drunk all the time and you're wondering what the fuck happened here oh, and no. he's and he's alone and he's on the road and which is kind of in a way where we meet him in the first season at the beginning so i thought we are beyond that at this point so what made him go back actually we get kind of filled into what happened here not completely right from the get-go like the show is throwing bits and pieces at us that we can garner from what kind of must have happened so the first hint is him talking to uh, the coach, to Nambu, to his best friend now, but always in situations where he's alone, where no one else is in the room, it's very depressing, and uh, Nambu is kind of berating him for certain things and everything, so you very quickly get the idea, okay, this is not, he's not really there, he's a specter of Joe's imagination, so odds are good that he, that Nambu probably died and that kind of hurled uh, Joe into a spiral of depression or something. We, mm. Like I said, we don't initially get the full picture of what happened there. That comes later and we'll get to that. But you get an idea. Okay, something bad happened with Nanbu. Something bad happened at Team Nowhere, which is what their dojo, their brand was called. That's what they called themselves. Like all the, the kids, Nanbu and Joe called themselves. So... We don't immediately get filled into that. The first part of this season is more about Joe finding back to himself and finding the courage to go back to that place, to that city and to Team Nowhere. The spark for that kind of gets lit by this guy called Chief, who Joe runs into at the beginning, of, like, already in the first episode. And Chief is, a part, is part of a group of refugees who are about to be chased off their land that they are currently occupying because it's going to be put up for auction. And Chief wants to win a big tournament in town to earn enough money to buy the land. So obviously, you know, he knows who Joe is and everything. And Joe can help him with the training and uh, everything. But also Chief can help Joe to find back to his old self and try helping him to work through his trauma, whatever that trauma might be. And yeah, that's basically, that's basically the entirety, the first part, well, I'm, well, it's the first four episodes, four or five, I'm not sure right now, but it will come up later uh, of the second season. And it's a really nice self-contained arc where it's mainly about the relationship between Joe and Chief 
and how they influence each other and what Chief does to get Joe back on his feet and vice versa and everything. And Chief's background story is really well done. He has a son that he lost. And that kind of relates to what we learn through the course of this first arc that Joe, for some reason, is, like we suspected, haunted by his regrets and holds himself responsible for killing Nanbu somehow, in a way. Like I said, Nanbu turns up as a specter and asks Joe to succumb to the painkillers and just waste his life away as punishment. And that's, yeah, that's basic. you know, it's, of course, it's Joe's subconscious and everything he's telling that himself because he's so full of regret and um, anger at himself and everything and is tortured by loss and all that. And um, mm -hmm. we get filled in more on that later, but that, that much is obvious from the very get-go. And then Chief kind of is like, hey, I kind of felt the same when I lost my son and I know what you need to get out of this. And that's why he's very carefully, he's not pushing Joe really too much. He's not like this, no, get get back on your feet, you, you lazy bum or something like that. He slowly works his way into uh, Joe's confidence and uh, Joe's mind and then lets him know that he empathizes with him and he knows what he's going through and he's helping him uh, or trying to help him. Uh, find a way out of this and find the courage to go home. There's this image of um, that's very prevalent in this second season of a um, hummingbird. And in the belief of Chief's people, which the show doesn't outright say what nationality they are, it's they're coded very much Mexican, I would say. But it's not really said if that is even a country in this universe, if that even exists or something. It's just like, hey, we are kind of refugees. We came over the sea from somewhere. They might also be Spanish or something, you know. But the music, the way, uh, you know, they dress, the way they talk and everything, and or imagery-wise, they are very much coded Hispanic. Chief tells Joe that the hummingbird is a symbol for the people and a sign of the gods there is somewhere to return home to. And they go into that in more, into more detail later in the story because there's like a children's book that also relates to that, that comes into play later on and the imagery of the hummingbird is all the way through the show it's in the logo of the show it appears uh, the hummingbird appears to certain characters at certain points in the show as in as a uh, mirage or something like that or like this guiding light that leads them somewhere and it's really interesting and combine that with a lot of the show you know like i said having this these hispanic influences and also the music that is fantastic the soundtrack I mean, the soundtrack of the first uh, season was already great, but this one is more, much more versatile and also really, really good. There's some really nice instrumental tracks in there. Uh, the ED is very promin prominent in the show as well, and we'll get to that. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. And it's really interesting how they work this kind of uh, stuff into the show and how that belief of the people and everything plays into getting Joe back on his feet. That's basically, like I said, the whole first part of this second season. Chief trains with Joe, and there's also a mother and a young delinquent that is kind of trying to rebel against his status as a poor refugee, hanging out with a bad crowd, and all of that is kind of being mixed into that and furthering the character development of, of Chief and of Joe, because both are kind of these fallen heroes, in a way, Chief to his people, or at least to that boy, in a way. And uh, Joe also was on the top of the boxing world and apparently fell from grace, although we don't know the details yet at that point, but that's where we are. So there's, there are like a lot of nice parallels between these two stories that the sh uh, first part of, uh, of this season goes into. And I think it worked really well. Like this show is just like the first season. You want to go to Megalobox for the writing. You don't want to go to it for the boxing. Which is weird because this is a show about boxing. <laughs> <laughs> but this, sadly, this, or sadly, well... I guess I prefer a, a well-written show over a show that has amazing boxing scenes, but that also counts for the second season because the boxing in the show still looks like shit. <laughs> in oh, no. my opinion, anyway. I mean, shit is harsh. It looks serviceable. It looks fine, I guess. I mean, TMS is doing a good job, definitely. But it's like, if you've seen Ippo, and if you consider that this is a show about boxes that literally put a bionic harness on their bodies 
And then the boxing is like the slow, deliberate, very strategic kind of boxing instead of this balls to the walls, insane people jumping in the air or boxing each other into, I don't know, into the next universe or something. That doesn't quite gel with me. Although, you know, in terms of tone, going over the top also wouldn't have worked. To be fair. Yeah. They have these bionics attached to them, right? Do you want to get hit by a punch like that? Not necessarily, no. <laughs> well, so, I mean... Yes, of course. But they get hit. The problem is when they get hit, it also sometimes just looks too... Wimpy is maybe the... I don't know if that's the right word. But it's like there's not, not enough... Not enough impact. Not enough impact, right. Sometimes there is. There are like one or two fights in here that look cool and impactful. But that's not enough for me. I want like this, if there's action and if there's boxing action in there, I want to feel every fucking hit. And I don't in this show. And like you said, they have that bionic gear, so the hits should hit twice as hard, at least when it comes to feeling it while you're watching it. And sometimes there are like some really good exchanges in there, like in two fights or something, but there are more fights in there and most of them just don't look that good. And that's a shame. I also can understand hey, this is more a show about the characters, this is more a show about character development, and especially in this season, it's about loss, it's about regret, it's about finding a way again, finding home again, betraying the people you love, making amends to the people you love, and so on. This is the important core of the show. Family is the core of the show. Family? Family? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> get Vin Diesel on the line yeah 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 it's kind of it, it would work but there's more action in Fast and Furious there's definitely more over the top <laughs> action than in this so tone wise this kind of works because it's more grounded it's really down it's a really down to earth show but then again I wonder why did you put that bionic stuff in there that kind of I don't know Gives, it, looks gives wrong cool. it does look cool yeah that's true but that also then is more disappointing if they don't really do anything with that so yeah. it's weird i don't think the original ashta no joe had bionic boxing gear so i thought there was just normal box fight boxing fights so it's weird to me that they would just add that for some reason and then don't do anything with it i mean they do some with it in the terms of that joe of course in the first season gets his big push because he doesn't use any gear and it's just Mm. him and also in this season they do something with that at the end when his journey is complete kind of he puts on the gear that chief wore that has also an emblem of the hummingbird on the shoulder he puts it on so it will protect him and bring him back to his family which is kind of what the hummingbird uh, symbolizes and what chief got into him and you know, made him confront his fears and everything. So as symbol for him honoring that and deeming that something important and something that he has accomplished is now more important to him than staying true to just fighting for himself, aka fighting without gear and being the guy who can do it without gear. So he just Mm. does a normal fight with normal gear and it's the gear of a friend he made and that showed him how important family is and uh, showed him the way home so that's you know there is something they do with that in that regard but in terms of the boxing itself it's just like yeah it's not as visually uh, as visually interesting as it could have been and that's a bit of a bummer but also compared to what the show is doing with its characters and its story it's not as important it's just one of the if you if you read the summary of the show you maybe see a trailer that is very well cut you might think oh this is a show with cool boxing and cool action and that's not what the show is about (laughs) not at all (laughs) so you need to know that i think before getting into this because this is what almost in the beginning turned me off from the first season a bit but you know i got over that and i'm glad i did because i really enjoyed the first season ultimately because of the characters because of the story and even more so the second season because i think the second season is even better than the first one for several reasons because they really expand on the characters and really do something with that and really put them through the ringer in this and deliver some really poignant storytelling in this and it's great so yeah uh like i said let's get back to where we actually started joe and chief train together and ultimately joe goes cold turkey to get off the shitty painkillers and, you know, even more haunted by Nanbu at this point, who's just, like, taunting him and trying to get him back on the, you know, uh, on the dragon or something, <laughs> chasing the dragon. 
And it's it's really interesting, like I said, what they do with Chief and Joe. And it's also interesting what they do with the town. Like the whole town is treating the immigrants like garbage. And the woman and her sons, um, Mara and Mio, Mio tries to be part of a gang working under the guy who is trying to auction off the land. So that complicates things, of course. But like I said, starts reconsidering when the when the asshole in uh, assholes in his crew use Molotov cocktails on Chief's trailer to try to stop him from taking part in the tournament. Because, of course, their boss is scared that Chief might actually win the tournament. So they want to stop him from participating, right? Uh, because he was a, a very good megaloboxer at one point. As with the first season, small tangent again, this show is ridiculously cool looking and beautiful. If you haven't listened to my review of the first season, maybe go back and do that. <laughs> because like I said, this, this is full of spoilers. But what they did with the first season with Megalobox is they... I think they designed it in high quality, in, in a high resolution. They drew it all in high resolution and then downscaled it. And I think then upscaled it again through a different filter or something. So that's why Megalobox both seasons kind of looked like this... This weird hybrid show of late 80s anime in terms of, you know, resolution and character models and everything or early 90s or something right before we switched over to digital, digital to paint and everything. But, you know, with the with the backgrounds and with with the stable quality of a current anime show. So you get the best of both worlds, really. You get design, the design sensibilities and the style of a cool 80s, early 90s anime, but you get the, the the actual quality in a way uh the actual the production values of one of the newer anime with the good production value so this this is really good and the the show looks amazing all the way through of course there are some episodes that don't look as as good um they're cutting some corners here and there maybe but it it's barely noticeable and the character models are always on model and you know always look sharp and fantastic and it's just a really, really cool style. If you're on the look for, for an anime with a really cool style, this is your show. This is what you should, should check out. And yeah, that is even more so true for the second season than the first one. I don't remember if it's uh, as visually interesting from the, from the environments as the first season, because of the first season had a lot of city stuff, you know, neo-cyberpunk-ish city in a way. And this is more... In this, there's a lot more, let's say, desert, barren wasteland imagery, which, of course, just from a visual perspective, is not as interesting, I guess. But it still looks really good. <laughs> and it, it just fits the tone of the season. Because most of this is wandering, Joe literally wandering through the wastelands of his life and trying to get to some version of paradise or what was paradise for him once. Mm. And trying to reclaim that. So it all fits. <laughs> and like I said, the show still all the way through looks fantastic. So it's really good. And yeah, the championship match between Chief and the guy from the company that is trying to auction off the land is the big kind of climax of this first arc, this first self-contained mini arc, or in a way self-contained. Yeah, it's it's really gruesome. There's a lot of racism thrown around, even by the ring announcer. So the show kind of gets political in a way too. And uh, the other fighter cheats a lot. He punches Chief in the back several times, in the back of the head. Shit. And, yeah, it's, it's really hard to watch. And it doesn't really help him because Chief actually manages to win the championship and buy his people's freedom. So in that regard, it's happy and it's really satisfying. And even Mio, you know, who was kind of lost as well, uh, the young kid, motivated by Chief holding up his promise because Chief promised, I'm going to get into that ring, I'm going to win the championship. And Mio didn't believe him. Mio turns now motivated by that, by Chief actually accomplishing that. He turns his life around and says goodbye to the punks he hung out with, which was also really nice. And it felt like that also mattered to that character arc and was really well done. It's really cool. Everyone celebrates around the campfire and everything. Like all the, it's a big old party. It's really nice. And uh, and Joe finally decides that he won't run away anymore and will return to whatever is left of his home. And Chief hugs him and says he's family and will always have a place with his people and that he's looking forward to fighting him in the ring once more. 
because in the very first episode they fight and Chief punches the shit off Joe because Joe's on painkillers and drunk as fuck. But yeah, it's a really nice moment between them and you feel like Joe is, after God knows how long, happy again and feels like he's finally ready to get back what he lost. And then Chief goes to sleep in his car and never wakes up. Oh. <laughs> It's not made clear if it was because of his head trauma suffered during the match or his heart or whatever, but Chief dies. It's fucking sad. I kind of had an inkling they would go a sad route, but I didn't expect them to pull it off so well and so just matter-of-factly and somber. It's not like he keels over in a dramatic way and says some final words to Joe, something like, go back to your family or some cheesy shit like that. No, he just goes back to his to his car and then the next morning Mio finds him and is distraught and cries and that's it. But he achieved his goal and is now reunited with his son, if you want to believe in the afterlife. And it's quite a beautiful story arc inside the bigger story of Joe's. And I loved these first four episodes. And especially Joe's and Chief's dynamic is excellent. It's so well written. Like these characters, you totally understand where they're coming from. I mean, you had one season with to spend with Joe, so you know what he's about. But also him being at this really bad place in his life and then so one person coming into that life and holding how to, reaching out, holding out a hand and being like, hey, I know what you need and I can give it to you if you let me. And Joe taking that hand and then these two growing close together. But then that person passing. It's so sad and so beautiful and so fucking well done. I... I mean, I was already in from the get-go, but at this point, I was like, oh my god, this is so fucking good. <laughs> so, this is so great. And, yeah, I loved it. I thought these first four episodes were some of the best storytelling. Definitely, I've seen in a sports anime, but also in anime in general. It was really well done in a season that, honestly, is filled to the brim with well-written anime. <laughs> Let's be honest here, because what the fuck... This is also, again, a standout, which is not going to make choosing the best of the season at the end of this season any easier. It's, whoa, it's just goddamn. And we're not even done yet. So the next arc is obviously trying to finally find out what actually happened at Team Nowhere and why Joe was at the place where he was at the beginning of the second season. So he returns home finds that the gym of Team Nowhere was flooded during a typhoon and is basically completely destroyed. And all the kids that he was with have moved on in the past five years, found jobs, and everybody hates his guts. Especially oh. Sachio, who beats the shit out of Joe uh, when he sees him hovering around the old Team Nowhere grounds. Because Joe lets him, let's be honest, Joe at this point is trained again and he could beat the shit out of Sachio, but he's still like riddled with guilt and he knows why Sachu is mad at him even though we don't really at this point know entirely why he is so mad and what exactly happened and in episode 5 we finally uh, find out why that is why Sachu is so angry at him and why Joe is so guilt ridden turns out Nanbu everyone's mentor got diagnosed with cancer and yeah this is a very happy show uh, <laughs> <laughs> And who Nanbu, honestly, his character arc was the high point of season one. It's not... I would say season one is even more Nanbu's story than it is Joe's. And second season is Joe's story. It's of two parts. It's both these characters. And, you know, they, they are really important together. And you need both these seasons for this... For the second season to work so well. And for Joe's character arc to work so well. But I think it's even... Joe is... And his relationship to Nanbu is more important with a focus more on Joe in the second season, with a focus more on Nanbu and where he is going in the first season. Yeah, turns out Nanbu was diagnosed with cancer and refused the treatment because he wanted to live his last days in peace with his new family, with Sachio, with the other kids, with Joe, their happy family. Now he now has a family. He's really content with where he is. And he's like, no, I've I've lived a good life and I'm happy what I accomplished, especially what happened in the first season. And he's now content with who he is. And he's like, okay, I can, I can die happily. 
But Joe, seeing all the kids very unhappy, and of course he has his own holdups with this situation, tries to motivate him to fight the cancer by making a pact with him and getting Joe himself getting back in the ring after two years of not fighting at all. And he's like, "Hey, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do this, this, this match. I'm gonna do this match against the new champion, against uh, Liu, uh, who is the student of Yuri." And if if I actually manage to do that, if I get in the ring and do that hard fight, you gotta fight and win against cancer, so to speak. You you gotta have it in you. If I have to, let's do that together. And yeah, it's kind of basically the same story as in Creed, <laughs> the movie with Sylvester Stallone and Michael B. Jordan, in mm-hmm. a way. But yeah, uh, it's kind of that's the motivation. But it's a bit more simple in Creed here. On the surface, this is a noble feat, and you get the idea. Joe is partially doing this to give the kids, and especially Sacho, who is just crestfallen because Nanbu is about to die, and they know it. And Joe wants to give them some hope. But mostly, as it turns out, and as you quickly realize, he is doing it because he can't handle the thought of losing Nanbu, his best friend. He can handle that, the least of all of them. And the fighting gives him a chance to block everything else out and cling to false dreams and hope. He feels powerless in the face of death, and this gives him the feeling like he can do something about the whole situation, instead of just resigning to that. Uh, It's super understandable and relatable, but nevertheless, it's not what he's supposed to do. He's just supposed to take care of the kids, to shoulder and ease their grief, and most important of all, be by Nanbu's side as much as he can be. And Sachio tells him that, tells him it as it is, right to the face. But Joe doesn't listen. He says the fight will help pay for the best treatment and you focus on death too much, you're just exhausted. And he just lies to the kids and to himself at this point. And it's really hard to watch. It's because you you totally understand where Joe is coming from, especially if you have been in that kind of situation where one of your family members maybe was threatened by a disease or something. And you kind of like, you want to motivate them to fight. But if they're kind of so, you know, they're like, no, I just want to, I just want to live my days in peace. And I want to be there for my family. And I want my family to be with you. I just want to be happy for the rest of my life and not just, just suffer. And you understand that Joe is like, that's really hard for him to just accept that. Seeing everyone around him be sad about it, all the kids that he really cares for be sad about it, and himself having to battle with these emotions. Because he probably never has cared as much as he now cares for these kids, and for Nanbu especially. So you can understand why he's just fleeing into this delusion that this is the best choice, that he will accomplish something with that and that's that this is more important than spending time uh nanbu and following his wishes and you know being there for the kids and yeah it's it's hard to watch and you understand where Satu is coming from because he's he felt like he's left alone by joe because now he is the only one who is at nanbu's deathbed basically and has to witness all that and nanbu not getting better but getting worse and Joe is just fixated on fighting and being like, no, I need to do this because this will help Nambu, I'm sure. But again, he lies to himself. It's well done, but it's also, like I said, harsh, harsh to watch. Interesting bit here. Sachio has almost the same haircut in his grown-up teenager form as the original Ashtano Joe and has mm. now taken on Megalo boxing as well. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> it's not exactly where the show goes but you know it's kind of like hmm I don't know maybe at some point in the future he might come back and he might don for some reason the name of his mentor or something we'll see we'll see it's very, it's it's really interesting it's it's a nice bit that you can pick up on another thing you I didn't pick up on was that uh, Oichu one of the kids uh, from the first season was apparently a girl well now that she's grown up <laughs> you know and uh, I don't know if it was if they decided to that to be the case in the first season uh, and I just looked oh just it, it went past me it went over my head or if they just decided to make her that in the second season I don't know but it was a nice bit I was surprised by that and 
things get more, let's say, complicated when Sachio attacks a jerk from the underground Megalobox outfit he's boxing for, who's causing trouble in one of the other kids' uh, restaurants, Bonchiri. And this backfires and leads to the restaurant being trashed and Bonchiri being forced to hand over the deed uh, of the restaurant to the assholes as reparation for what Sachio did. And Sachio needs to fight a murder hawk monster, <laughs> excuse me, mohawk monster, to win the deed back. But since he sucks at boxing right now, he always fights clean. Joe uh, steps in without asking and loses on purpose to get the deed back. And the kids get why he's doing that. And it's, of course, Joe's attempt to make amends. But Oichu says she gets why he has done it, but she won't thank him. Because it's the same back when he just decided to set up the fight against Liu, the pupil of the former champ and his rival Yuri, instead of being with Nanbu. Uh, when he was his death's door. He didn't discuss it with them, he just decided it on his own. You don't do that to your family. Mm. Back then, it was to run away from the true fight that really scared him, acknowledging that Nabu will die. And we see it very clearly. Sachu calls from the hospital to say Nanbu's condition has taken a turn for the worse right before the fight, and instead of rushing to the hospital, Joe still goes through with the fight, using the promise he made to Nanbu as an excuse which again, he decided on his own, that promise was never something that Nanbu wanted or asked him to do. And it's heartbreaking seeing him lose against Liu and then stumbling back towards his opponent yelling, I can still fight. It can't be over. It can't just be over. Because you know what he is really talking about. And even though Sachu is the one who ultimately pushed Joe away after Nanbu died and told him that they're not family anymore and he doesn't want to see his face ever again, Oichu is right when she said, you don't do that just because someone tells you to, if you really care for them. Joe again ran away from the more difficult fight, which would have been making amends and patching things up with his family, and instead he got on the road and drowned himself in alcohol and painkillers. So he, you know... He has some things to make right, and he's trying to do that now. Still not in the right way, <laughs> in a way, because again, like Ocho said, he didn't consult with them. He just decided to do certain things on his own. So he actually needs to learn to trust his family and trying to, to involve them in these processes and trying to make them part of this, even if they, don't, if, if they are pushing him away, like Sachio does. And yeah, on the other side of things, which gets us an idea of what this season will culminate into, maybe, but also not. <laughs> uh, uh, Liu, the guy he boxed against and lost, still feels like he's chasing Joe's shadow because Joe wasn't giving 100% when he fought him, which is understandable because he was going through severe emotional turmoil. But Liu also feels like people are seeing him just as Yuri's pupil and not his own man. And so he's like, hey, Joe, you're back. Want to fight, right? And Joe is considering it, kind of, in a way. And they have, like, the sparring match. And this is one of the really cool matches in the show. One of the two or one and a half, I would say. Because it's very short. It's very, very sweet finally shows off some legit cool fast-paced boxing with really vivid camera work and some cool choreography. And I thought, oh, finally, finally, this is okay. Now we're getting more of this. Uh, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> a bit, a bit in the final fight, a bit in the final fight. There's some cool moments in there, but not as good as this. So it's kind of like this short spark where it's like, oh, yes, good. More of this. Yeah, but it's kind of the only thing we're getting of this kind of quality in terms of the boxing. So <laughs> it was kind of a bit of a shame. But, you know, can't complain. At least I got something. So that's good. And yeah, we then get introduced to Leo's opponent for the championship title, Mac, who also has a really interesting backstory. Uh, he's a boxer who wasn't as successful, then became a cop. And due to an accident when he saved some kids, not accident, he got shot when saving kids from a burning gang building or something, he got turned into a cripple. And then famous bionic company jumped in and turned him into a literal bionic megaloboxer. Not only a harness, but he's kind of fused to his harness in a way, a bit 
Dr. Octopus Sish, I would say. Whereas like some of that is now part of his body and he controls his limb through his uh, through his brain, through a chip in his brain. And that's how he can walk again and that's how he can actually box and he's now better than ever. Uh, it's neat. And you immediately feel like rooting for him as well because he's this really upstanding guy with a with an interesting history and he seems to want to do the right thing and he has a loving wife and a kid that adores him and everything and he's like wow this is interesting okay this will be a cool fight between Liu and Mac and that fight is cool too and then something weird happens to Mac during the fight he goes into something called Mac time where he sudden where his reflexes apparently become better at everything and he punches Lou so hard that he suffers severe head trauma. And you immediately get the feeling, okay, something is not right with Mac here. Because he gets like this distant stare once he has been put into the corner by Liu and pressured. And just starts like laying into him. He's like in a daze. And you don't feel like he's in control. And very quickly it becomes evident that this is his gear the software in his bionics that has a bug and that just makes him just losing control and losing consciousness basically he gets reduced to a childlike state where he just reacts and doesn't think anymore and it's really scary and there's some moments where that happens in his daily life as well where he just suddenly starts eating his son's food for no reason and just it falls to the ground and he starts eating it from the ground just he's just trying to consume it because he's hungry like all his senses are gone and he's just pure instinct and it's really scary and he makes his son cry and then doesn't remember what he did and everything so like i said his software his gear which is called bes i don't remember what it stands for bionic extension system or something is bugged and the head of the company that created Megalonia in the first season, Yukiko, is investigating because they are working together with the company that created the BES for Mac. And they're like in this joint program, they have, have an alliance kind of. And she starts investigating this to find out if there actually is a bug because her brother is writing an article about it and everything. And uh, so she wants to find out if she's actually been funding and helping developing a fl flawed tech that is kind of right now on the verge of destroying a person's life. And then we got this tech bro who is the head of the, the company that developed that bionic gear. I forgot his name. I wrote it down later in my notes. Wait, let me try to find it. Uh, I'll come later. I, I'm, I'm going to call him Tech Bro for now. <laughs> he probably knows what is going on. He seems to be very aloof about it. It's like, eh, I have, mm, it's all fine. Don't worry about it. He doesn't care because his company stocks are going through the roof since Mac is, you know, has won the championship match and everything with this bionic uh, extension system and all that stuff. So naturally, he doesn't want to rock the boat and it's like, nah, it's all fine. He falsifies some data and stuff like that. And meanwhile, Mac's condition gets worse. So uncool. So there's this side plot kind of where, uh, you know, there's a bit of company conspiracy going on, which is also, you know, it's not really necessary to the core of the story, really. But Mac is also kind of a person that is trying to find home in a way because of what he has lost and everything and regrets he has. So that kind of spins into that. Yeah, but there are some parallels here and there and it kind of works. Uh, and it's just a nice side story that adds a bit of intrigue to your general character plots and everything. So and it gives Yukiko something to do because she's also a cool character and it sets up also Mac as this tragic figure that you can easily relate to and gives this story at least some kind of a villain, even though I'm not sure it needed one, but it's in there, so that's fine. But yeah, there is a parallel of Joe wanting to believe that he will be able to keep his promise to fight Liu, but Yuri thinks that's naive and Liu can be lucky if he survives his injury. And that's a parallel to what Joe experienced with Nanbu earlier. It's, again, him having trouble with accepting what's right in front of him. So Liu being paralyzed from the fight against Mac, it's kind of like, no, he's going to fight me eventually. That's what Joe says anyway. And yeah, uh, Yuri is like, you're 
you're being a bit too optimistic. It's nice that you can be that, but don't try to cling to that too much. And you need to be a bit realistic at a certain point. There's also, again, the hummingbird comes into play again as a symbol. And now we get filled into the whole story with the gods and everything. There is a children's book story that Mech reads to his son. And I think he's supposed to be of the same people that Chief is. And it's kind of apparently the same myth, the same story. And now we get the whole idea where that sprung from and what that story is about. And I'm not going to recount it. <laughs> it's a story about a hummingbird and a nomad. Mm, title drop. And the story itself is beautifully told bit by bit in the last couple of episodes. And it's a beautiful parallel to each major character in this season because... Ultimately, this is a story about loss and how to find the will to move on and finding your way back home. And that's also what the story of the Nomad and the Hummingbird is about. And that becomes uh, clear at the very end when that story is finished in the final episode. And it's like this really nice literal bookend uh, on the whole story. And that was also done really, really well. It turns out... Also, at this point in the story, that Sachio felt responsible for driving away Joe, in a way, and tried to take his place and responsibilities, which was also a huge burden on him and everything, which is also why he was hesitant to let Joe back into their lives. And they do some good character development with him, and it's not like just this angry teen lashing out at someone. You really understand where he was coming from and why he is so disappointed with Joe and everything. And that's really cool. And the story picks up and we kind of get to that climax where Mac and Joe fight each other in the ring because, you know, Leo can't fight anymore. And there is a match that is going to happen between Joe and Mac instead. And Mac is at risk of losing himself with the BAS and everything. And like I said, the tech bro knows the BAS might be malfunctioning, but he wants to sell it to the army. Very nice. Oh, no. So he tries to keep a lid on it. When Yukiko says, of course, the army likes the tech because it means they can reuse soldiers that have been injured on the battlefield and, you know, have become cripples and stuff like that. Sakuma, that was his name, right. Sakuma, the tech bro, <laughs> berates her for making soldiers sound like things. But his interest in human spirit is just a front, I think, because <laughs> later he speaks of Mac as a product. Uh, mm -hmm. in the same episode and also goads him into boxing against Joe so that Mac doesn't leave boxing behind and he can still ride the wave of his success and so that his tech is being like uh, still hailed as this uh, the coming of the next century and so on. So he's a real piece of shit. <laughs> Sounds like it, Jesus. Uh, yeah, and like I said, he's also falsifying data and threatening Yukiko's brother to make him rescind his statements. He's basically like, hey, we're going to throw you out of the university and everything or make your life really hard. Fuck that guy. Jeez. It's even worse than that. Turns out when Mac got shot, Sakuma offered Maya, Mac's wife, to get their son a heart transplant he needed if she agreed for Mac to be a guinea pig for BES. Even though he would have probably been able to walk again with enough physical therapy. So he just pressured his wife like, hey, I'm going to give you, I'm going to make it possible that your son gets the heart transplants he needs. But, you know, even though your husband can probably regain his full health by himself, just let me do that operation on him and tell him that he needs it. And uh, yeah, he... <laughs> he justifies it all by saying it's for, great, for a greater future. But he doesn't care if people get hurt along the way. He doesn't give a shit. Mm. And considering Mac is the literal Robocop of the story, Sakuma is the actual machine. A cold, heartless monster that for some reason likes to tap dance, of all things. It's just like you love to hate that guy. He's just a, he's a, just a giant piece of shit. <laughs> the moment he walks into a room, you immediately look at him and like, oh, oh, okay. It's that kind of guy. <laughs> He's so fucking smug and aloof. And yeah, it's not over the, the top or anything. He feels like that could be a real person, but he's such a... He's such a fucking piece of shit. <laughs> so, like I said, it's a good, he's a good villain. I don't know if he necessarily needed to be in the story, but he's at least not a throwaway villain. He's integrated, integrated into the story, and you really love to hate him. So, <laughs> he's well done. 
And then we have a clash between Joe and Sachio in the ring. I don't think what the actual motivation for is that story-wise, just plot-wise. I think it's for... I don't know if Sachio wants to fight Mac or, or he doesn't... He wants to stop Joe from from fighting or something. I don't quite remember it. But, of course, the the actual motivation, the actual story is they need to sort out their differences. And they're doing that through boxing because this is anime. <laughs> it's a sports anime. So they talk to each other with their fists. Mm. And it's very, it's a very satisfying clash uh, from an emotional standpoint. Like I said, Sachu has been blaming himself as much as he blamed Joe for tearing their family apart. And now Joe tells him that it was entirely his fault, uh, Joe's fault, and that he is a selfish man and Sachu has nothing to apologize for. Which is the thing Sachu needed to hear to let go of his despair and anger towards Joe and towards himself because he wasn't able to live up to Joe's ideal. All that burden that he put on himself at that moment just gets swapped away because Joe takes it back and puts it entirely on himself. It's like, no, this was entirely my fault. You did what you could and you did good, kid. And now I'm just going to shoulder the blame myself. And it's great. And obviously, Sachio hasn't forgiven him yet. He probably never will. He says as much. But he doesn't, like I said, he doesn't have to shoulder the burden anymore. And that is enough for now and enough to make him reconcile with Joe and to like take his hand and to for them to start becoming a family again and making you know new uh, taking some new steps to forgive each other in a way so it's really cool and yeah the story of the hummingbird and the nomad comes to a beautiful conclusion that totally gels with what the story is doing at this point and where the characters are at this point and it's all this beautiful analogy and it works really well and there is like a guitar player playing, uh, playing in a park near Mac, who has found out about the bug in the BAS and, you know, the stuff with uh, that he actually didn't need that, that bionic thing and everything. And he's just wandering the streets drunk and it's like, shit, you know, my life is fucked and everything and my family is scared of me. And then he runs into some of his old police buddies and then is next to a park where someone starts playing a song that we have heard earlier in the season... Because it's the same song that Chief played when Joe met him in the first episode. Mm -hmm. And that song appropriately is called The Hummingbird Song or El Canto del Colibri, which is also the ED of the second season. And then in, when the song starts playing and we see Max's entire backstory from when he started, when he came over to this country by boat and then started off as a boxer, didn't make it there moved over to becoming a cop, found a family in between, got a kid, was really happy, then got crippled, then got back on his feet again, thanks to the BAS, quote-unquote. He probably would have been able to do that again and find a new new goal in megaloboxing. And that moment is perfectly staged and executed and it's incredibly moving. Like the song in the background, seeing his entire life story, see where he came from and what he went through. And then he goes back to his family and it's like i'm sorry for everything and i'm i will find a way to do uh, to do this and uh i will find a way to get back to you and you know return to you uh i found my way back home and everything comes full circle and it makes sense because mac and chief seem to be like from the same country original uh, originally so that song meaning something to them being part of the of the religion or the lore or the myth of their people and it works so well. It works well in regards to what Joe went through. It's all about coming home. It's all about coming home to your family, finding what is important to you, realizing that what you had was there all along and that you can go back to it. And that's not, it's not lost. Even if you feel like you have lost so much, you still have something in your life. There is still something there because you've had these experiences. And you can find, you can find a new way and you can find, as long as you are alive, you can build upon that and you can start something new. And it's beautiful. It's just simply fucking beautiful. And yeah, like I said, Joe puts on Chief's gear with the symbol of the hummingbird on his shoulder for his fight against Mac, like I said, for protection. And that he will survive this fight because apparently Joe also has some problems because with boxers and everything if you get punched in the head a lot shit happens to your brain yeah. so and and joe kind of has has a condition but 
he puts on that gear and it's like that's that is that's gonna protect me you know if he was still the old joe he would just do it unprotected and would try to live up to his name but he's not that anymore he has realized no Sachu is more important, the kids are more important, everyone at, uh, at Team Nowhere is more important, and it's more important that I get home safely than actually being Gearless Joe. And that's really cool. <laughs> that's a really nice book to his character arc. And yeah, the fight is pretty good. Not the best, but it's, it's all right. And it's happening while Yukiko is putting Sakuma, the asshole tech bro, in his place and forces him to take responsibility just like she will and it's pretty badass you know that basically her her words coming in in sync with the hits <laughs> in the boxing fight and she's just laying into uh, Sakuma like no I'm gonna I'm gonna tell the whole world that this shit happened and the, there's a bug in the system and you will go to fucking jail and you will take responsibility for what you did and it's really satisfying and it's really cool the end of the fight is a tad anticlimactic because it's just basically a win by uh, by points, I think. No, no. Um, Sachio, when he realizes that Joe is at, at his... Um, basically, at, at the end of his rope, he just throws in a towel to protect him so he doesn't get hurt badly. But on a thematic level, it makes sense. You know, because Joe said, the most important thing is I get back to you. So if you see that I can't bear it anymore and I am at the point where I don't realize it, throw in the towel. It's important throw it in earlier rather than later i won't berate you for it or anything and such does that so it just ends on like this it just the match just stops there's no satisfying ko or anything but it just, like i said from a thematic standpoint it works really well and the ending is really satisfying and the soundtrack once again makes these final moments of the show shine even more and it's fucking perfect and here we are and it's this is a great season of anime I could, I don't think, aside from maybe a bit more exciting boxing fights, I couldn't have asked for more from a second season of that. And just like I said, after probably the end of the first season, we don't really need a new season of this. But then again, considering how good the second season I didn't expect I would get and I didn't think I would need uh, <laughs> was how great the second season was, I wouldn't mind the third season. Though I'm not sure what else they're going to do with these characters now. Maybe they're going to shift over to Sachio or something because at the end of the season he's going his own way and kind of leaving his family a while to start an apprenticeship for something. I don't remember what. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool. And I, I loved it. I thought this was fantastic. I enjoyed it immensely. I've, it's put me close to tears at several points in the show. It was really moving. It was a really fantastic emotional journey for a bunch of characters. For Chief, for Joe, for Sachio, for the kids, for Liu, for Mac. There were so many well done character stories, character arcs in this show. In certain shows you barely get one. In this you get like five or six. <laughs> so it's amazing that they pulled that off. It's great. And uh, I can't really add anything more to that. I mean, I sp continued series you wrote, so I spoiled all of it, but I still think if you feel like this is something that sounds great, you should check it out. Of course, it's more impactful and engaging if you actually watch it, except, <laughs> you know, instead of listening to uh, me telling you about it. And of course, you get the visual aspect and everything. So definitely do that i think both seasons of megalobox are great just don't go into the show expecting this is going to be something as action-packed as visually enticing as um as uh hajime no Epo in terms of the boxing so yeah go in it for the story for the characters and you will not be disappointed uh with either uh, either of the seasons and i think the second season is stronger than the first one definitely but this first one is already great so can't really do uh, anything wrong by watching Megalobox season one and two or Megalobox and Nomad. And yeah, it's it's great. And I hope I don't butcher that. But since that is, I think this is what all the episodes of Nomad end with. I'm going to end this review with it. And it's hasta ver la luz until I see the light. Right, so, like you said at the top of the show, it's time for some revenge. Um, not going to do the Vincent Price R rolling as much this time, I promise. But yes, Zombie Land Saga Revenge is the return, the second season of our girls in the Undead Idol group Fran Shushu. 
and uh, they're back for more. And they were planning a massive blow-up performance at a giant venue, and the show turns out to be a gigantic flop, uh, as we pointed out in the sneak preview. Uh, Sakura and the other girls need to take on odd jobs to pay off the debt they owe. And when they decide they want to try their luck at one final show back where it all began, they employ their manager Tatsumi to support them. But he's 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 gone. He's just in a drunken slump, and he's he's not in a good place either. And this is a story all about Fran Shushu restoring their former greatness to become rising stars once again. Uh, I believe I quoted the intro song saying that even if this is their lowest point, even if they're starting over from zero, it's just part of their saga. <laughs> saga. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the show doesn't exactly pick up right where it left off. No, it makes a big time jump, actually. Which, kind of. uh, which I know you took issue with. Yes, I expected some, you know, that to be the big, you know reveal in the first episode like i elaborated on that in the in the sneak peek there was something like why why would you skip over that i mean what having watched this season i now kind of get why they were doing that because it kind of also they do some kind of thing with that at full circle at the end of the of the season i still think it would have worked better if they hadn't skipped that if that would have been the big cliffhanger thing at the end of the first episode was like everyone is in high spirits and then suddenly no one is at the fucking concert and they crash and burn it's like (laughs) what the fuck and then we make the time jump so i guess that would have worked better for me i guess they wanted to make the first season like uh, the first episode like wait what the fuck happened why why are the girls working what what is happening what is everyone doing and make it a bit of a mystery in that regard i guess uh but you also get filled on it pretty quickly so i i don't know (laughs) it's it was weird to me a bit I mean, you know, this whole in medias res uh, mm. writing style, you know, that can that can work. I guess for you, it didn't. No, I mean, like, I I don't need a plot twist in there, but it, w- it would have just, like, been a nice shocking thing at the end of the first episode. Because you think, oh, now the girls are successful. They're going somewhere. And what is the next plan? And then, nope, <laughs> it's not that simple, guys. And we kind of already... We we join the girls once they're already past that point. But again, we get filled over the course of the season a bit more into what happened and what happened to Kotaro and everything. So uh, that's why they did that. I don't know if I agree with the, that choice necessarily, but I also wouldn't say it really hurts the show or anything. No. It's just a choice I would have made differently, probably. So that's my only point of contention here. But yeah, the... The crux of this part of the story is trying to make up a debt of 20 million yen that Kotaro and the girls owe to the venue, the Ekimai Hudo-san Stadium. And how are you going to make that much money? Holy shit. So, you know, they end up doing all sorts of uh, whatever they can. The One of the first things they do is they make their way onto a local radio show, uh, Saki uh, Note knows of the uh, DJ on there, White Ryu, and she's a super big fan and kind of uh, elbows her way in there and basically makes uh, the girls from France who shoot regulars on the show. So now they now they basically have their own radio show. So, you know, that's, that's a pretty good source of income right there. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the – probably one of the best uh, parts of that episode is – Saki, you know, she accepts uh, the regular role on this radio show, and she just outright says to White Ryu that she's in love with him, and it's like it, it just happens. You mm-hmm. don't expect it to happen, like you know, all the signs are there, and then she just out and says it, and it's like, holy shit! All right, <laughs> but I mean, age wise, it would work, I guess, considering when she died. Yeah. It's just uh, the the nature of this confession. And you see soccer in the background, and her eyes literally pop out. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, you know, Ryu says, no, you know, just to come back to me in like 10 years when you're older. And Saki's like, well, you know, kind of a zombie. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the story with you was cu- uh, was cute, especially his producers freaking out when he just gives the sh- uh, his show to the girls. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was it was nice. <laughs> and, you know, 
him riding with this big fat fl- uh, fluffy pompadour yeah. on the hood of his car. Yeah, that no was once given. like the stiff thing in his youth, and now it's floppy. There's some imagery going on there that I won't go into. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it's funny. Like we said uh, back in the sneak preview, this 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 show definitely goes from humor to some good, strong, heartfelt moments, pretty well. Mm-hmm. I uh, also like. I, I I think that was also in the episode, the second performance, or was it in the third ep- I don't, uh, episode? I don't know. One of my critiques of the show were always the CG concerts, right? And the sec, at least this one episode uh, or one in that bunch has a traditionally animated um, yes. concert in it or performance in it, and it's also uh, there's a really good personal component to it, so it works yeah. really well in my opinion. It's great because the song they perform is a cover of one of Ryu's songs. Yes, yes. So ah, yeah, I, really I really strong. like. Yeah, it was probably my favorite performance in in this season. Yeah, I mean, I. <laughs> I'm not going to disagree with you about the CG. We'll get to that <laughs> in even more detail later uh, when when we uh, hit the fin- talk about the finale of this. But yeah, carry on. Yeah, um, a lot of the rest of this se- most a good chunk of the rest of the season is more character stories. Like after that one is. Um, Kotaro scheduling Fran Shushu to perform at this arena. I believe I think it was to be an opening act for another group. Oh yeah, it's the opening act for Iron Frill, the idol group that I used to be a part of. So he specifically withholds I from the performance because he thinks, oh, you know, what if the girls from Iron Frill uh recognize her and she actually runs into a couple of the girls on the street and they try to scout her from Franchushu back in Iron Frill and Sakura and Junko ha- overhear this conversation and they have a lot of doubts yeah. about what's going to happen to Franchushu after that understandably so I mean you know I is kind of she is the lead girl like she is the 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 person who knows the most about the idol business and everything she was the leader of the old group and basically and she she just she wouldn't necessarily say the heart but she's the brain and the outfit kind of like the one that holds everything together at this point at least that's what everyone thinks mm. but you know we'll get to that i guess uh, because this is also part of the character arcs in this story uh, the other girls realizing and especially junko that you know that is not necessarily the case that's that's one of the beauties about this which is even more so than the first season due to all of his loud nonsense antics you tend to forget that kotaro is actually a shrewd manager mm. and you know him pulling i away from the group because you know there is the stuff with the uh, with iron frill and everything and he has realized that while she has cemented herself as a capable leader, the others rely on her way too much instead of improving themselves as much as they could. That's all him. It's all him doing his magic and driving, pushing like the characters to new heights without them outright telling them what to do. Mm. He's just working in the background, his machinations, like he's a puppet master and he's like covering it all while being this, this loud nonsense person, this fucking clown. And uh, I, I really like that that it came through in the season that you really at some point get what he is doing, which I didn't get as much in the first season. But in this season, really understood, oh, he's doing that too. make that character go there and stuff like that. Well, I mean, season one, Kotaro is, oh, hi, mm-hmm. I mean, he's that still too. So, yes, but he's a lot more of that. And toward the end of the first season, you know, we start to learn that he's scheming something in that maybe there's some sort of relationship between him and that one barkeep who, you know, there's mm-hmm. suspicions about. And now, th- now I have a lot more suspicions and, mm-hmm. and a few questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely. Uh, the following episode, the girls put on their performance. Uh, and Kotaro... <laughs> Kotaro lends Junko his his prized electric guitar and telling her to use to smash through her insecurities. And they put on this 
absolutely electric show and Junko literally smashes his guitar and the look on Kotaro's face is just absolute disbelief it's so good i love that moment so much yes it's <laughs> it's it's really cool it's it's just in general there there's some moments in there i don't know there was another one where that's later in the show uh, later in the season where he gets in there and i think it's it's is it lily who has taken over kind of organizing things mm. uh and, and he just gets in there and is ready to just do his usual thing and she has already said no i'm gonna do that and we're gonna get on tv and shit and, and he's like oh hi yoko Mars." Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so good so fucking crestfallen that he doesn't get to do what he usually does it, it's really nice i like he's always you know and mamoru miyano of course in general but he is always uh, good for a laugh and this just being a fucking goofball <laughs> she, she's she got her own plan it's, it's almost like she's lily has pulled the rug out from her and kotaro's feet like i came up with this and he's like but but, but me though oh oh yeah. no <laughs> it's, it's it's pretty great there are several like kind of more low-key comedy moments in the season that i really liked yeah um, I mean, I, I generally like that the girls also kick Kotaro's ass when he goes overboard with his bullshit, which they do, like, literally kicking his ass. Mm. So I, I like that. But there are also some moments just between the girls where it's just like, hey, I feel like they're doing not enough with the zombie shtick at certain points or they rely too much on the same jokes. But then there are moments like the one where uh, Junko plays guitar and Sakura v visits her, falls off the roof, and her head sitting next to Junko until her body has climbed back up. <laughs> Yes. It made me chuckle. <laughs> it was just they were just talking. It was just like matter of factly, and then the body slowly comes back, and they just have this nice conversation. It's like it's just so fucking ridiculous, but also really down to earth and funny. I like that a lot. You, you know, your jokes don't have to always be just right in the face. You just gotta be, you know. No, oh, th th this this is happening, by the way. That sort of joke. Yeah, exactly. Just very low key, very ma matter of fact. Where on, on the side, it's just a nice visual gag that happens when there's actually some character development ha happening. Mm. So it's just like, yeah, put more information on the screen and make me laugh through that. Really well done. I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, we had. And, oh, oh. Sorry, another scene just came to my mind. Uh, <laughs> the scene where I slunge spells out "you suck" because some of the kelp was stuck on the lid and it was supposed to spell out "you succeed." Yes. I don't know what it said in in uh, in, in Japanese. Probably some half of Ganbare, and I don't know. I didn't what, like, what end that... up spelling out Baka instead or something. Yeah, maybe something like that. But that made me laugh, especially her reaction face. It was really <laughs> good. It was really good. So yeah, bunch of bunch of really cool jokes in this, and it's really cool. And Kotaro di uh, Kotaro's direct approach to making Junko believe in herself is actually successful. Mm. And you know, like you said, uh, said he tells her to smash hard and she literally does you know <laughs> didn't factor that into his calculations i guess but nope. <laughs> it works but I, it works and it's a really cool scene <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting you to take my advice literally oh mm -hmm. no yeah i mean also i gotta say fault. um mm -hmm. you know this uh show one of the centerpieces is the music and the performances mm. um Junko's voice actress maki kawase fucking holding it down super hard like, and that's not to say, every, you know, none of the other girls were, like, bad or lesser, but she was just, like, all in on, like, pretty much every song, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just in general for the songs, I liked the first song for the Iron Frill opening act. I didn't like the second one, even if the light show wasn't bad. I, I don't remember what those two were called. But I feel like the CG was just too stiff on that and makes the girls look more lifeless than they should, even mm. though they are zombies, of course. But it's like, I, th I felt like the first song was done better and the focus wasn't so much on that. And then kind of, I don't know, the second song, again, was not as good, and in my opinion. And also the performance was just not as great. But yeah, it's, it's cool. And after that, Iron Phil now considers them their top competition. Yes. It's really awesome. So, yeah. Then that stuff with the TV thing happens. And, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lily goes on TV of uh, the equivalent of America's Got Talent, pretty much, mm -hmm. and goes up against another child 
actor Light Ozora, and uh, he's kind of a little shithead. Uh, yeah, he. I mean, he's he's used to being successful and everything, and getting everything he wants by pretending to be a certain kind of person. But you know, they do something with it. Uh, yeah. You know, li- Lily being the nicest person, and you know, showing him what it's actually about. And her story has like this. Always has this nice bittersweet note to it because she will forever be trapped in a child's body. Mm. And, you know, because she can't aim for a future career as a grown woman like Light can. Like, you know, he aims for a career as a as a grown man. That's his goal. And she's like, I can't do that. So I'm just going to aim to be the best child star I can be. And her improvised remix goes viral with the kids and everything. And that's that's really nice. And I thought that was pulled off really well. Just how they wove that character of, of, of that guy, uh, that asshole, <laughs> that little shit in there. And then made him see that there's actually merit in being really good and not phoning it in. And, you know, really putting your heart into your performance, even if you're... Ha- having your um, eyes already saw- set on a different goal in the future. So I appreciated that. And of mm-hmm. course, I appreciated uh, Kotaro impersonating a mud skipper on stage to make Lily look better in comparison. Uh, it was kind of for- adorable. I've forgotten that. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good. <laughs> Kotaro is really good. Once you get over his annoying thing side, his the moments where he actually does things for the girls from an outside perspective, it looks like he just makes a fool out of himself and he's super vain or something. But you know, once you realize he's all, all doing all of this to save Saga and uh, to push the girls forward, you learn to appreciate it a lot more. Mm. After that, <laughs> we get a day out. With uh, the legend herself, Tai mm-hmm. Yamada. Um, she's out doing errands the best that she can. And what was the dog? Romero? Uh, yeah. R- Romero is doing his best to keep Tai on task, even though, you know, they're both very easily distracted. She enters a dance off at one point and beats the mascot of the drive-in Tory uh, fast food joint and wins 30,000 yen. So, hey, uh, money in the pocket for that debt. Mm-hmm. And then they all end up going to, I believe it's a, it's a boat race. Tai just ends up, you know, she doesn't know what the hell she's betting on. So she puts money down on something and she wins 20 million yen due to mm-hmm. this the low win chance of this one racer and that's your debt wiped clean <laughs> and that racer was uh, was uh, had relation to the biker girls from the first season right so mm-hmm. there was also a nice turn into that story uh, into that story again and everything so uh, I, I that that was also neat that they just wove that into there but yeah that that turned out pretty well for the girls, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Will but, we ever learn about Ty's past? We still haven't. No, we haven't. Like mm. she she's she's legendary. What makes her legendary? What makes I mean what she does on stage and, and the live does, but I still would like to know what where she came from and everything and who she is. I mean, well, I have my suspicions, but you know, maybe she will remain I a mean, mystery. I mean, not jumping too far ahead but i think we'll have an opportunity to find out mm-hmm. at some point mm-hmm. um but yeah tai goes back money in hand and sakura accidentally knocks her head off and exposes their secret to uh one of the reporters okoba because he's he's been following tai around probably pretty much the whole day and then there is that moment mm-hmm. oh no the jig might be up Yes, that's that's where the show, just in general, the latter third, I guess, yeah, of the yeah. show, third to uh, half become, ish. yeah, became more plot driven than I expected. <laughs> yeah. So this is kind of the start of that. Um. <laughs> then. Uh huh. <laughs> God fucking damn it! Kotaro goes to a local bathhouse, and he's he's cleaning himself up, and he. Drops a bar of soap. No big deal. Whatever. Okay. In walks this girl, Mai Mai Yuzuriha. And she can't see shit without her glasses on, so she walks into the wrong bath. 
slips on the soap and falls into the bath and is seemingly dead. Kotaro, in his infinite wisdom, (laughs) infinite wisdom, wraps the girl up and brings her back to the house and is like, uh, I'd like to introduce to you the, the eighth member of French Shushu. And all the girls are like, excuse me, what? Mm-hmm. Excuse me, what? <laughs> Gotta make her a zombie. <laughs> uh, and it turns out, uh, to borrow a line from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> my my is actually fine. <laughs> yeah, thankfully so. But she is... She is a fan of French Shushu, so that works out, I guess. Uh, so, but now she is privy to the secret. Yes, she is privy to the secret. And she's not really that faced by it, I would say. She's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think she says something along the lines of, you know, who cares if you're a human or a zombie, you know? Yeah. Whatever, yeah. that's fine. And it's one of those it's one of those moments where it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. okay. And it really it really works also as a character building moment for uh, Sakura, because just like Sakura was inspired by I to become an idol, Mai Mai was inspired by Sakura as well. So it's kind of like this, this nice inheritance of uh, ambition or whatever or inspiration and this having a nice echo to it, mm. let's say. So uh, yeah. Mai Mai joins Fran Shushu. Uh, she's uh, not very good at dancing, as I recall. But they, they cobble together a performance. She goes out on stage, and at the end of the first performance, she announces her graduation from Fran Shushu. And she promises to basically take the secret to her grave. Mm-hmm. Gotta say... Hmm. Her not telling the girls that she's going to leave the group again before they had that eighth member announcement is a bit of a dick move. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I get what you were doing, but still, they were so happy to have you in the group now. And then you're like, nope, I'm out again. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, I know it was for dramatic effect, you know, because of because this is a TV show and everything. And that's why they did it the way they did. But still, I felt like from a character standpoint, I would have been a bit pissed if I was any of the girls. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But it's fine. They they don't begrudge her on anything, so it worked out. She got to meet her idols. She got to be one of her idols, and now she's gonna you know keep that secret. So you know, mm-hmm. it, I, I guess it all worked out in the end, kind of, sort of. Yes, and you know, it give Sakura some some nice push and everything. So mm. it's it, yeah, it was worth having her on the team for a while. It's at this point that Okoba has kind of determined the identities of everyone in French Shushu except for Yugiri. And we have this like two episode long flashback about uh, Yugiri in back in uh, the good old days of the Meiji era. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's been a minute since she's been around. Um that, you know, she was a courtesan and she had her freedom bought from a, by a wealthy patron. And now she kind of lives in Saga in this very quiet life, you know, not making a big deal about who or what she was. But one day she happens upon this boy named Kichi Momozaki. A local young man who's determined to restore Saga's status as an independent prefecture. Hmm. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> but yes, Keiichi yeah. is making a big deal about, uh, you know, Saga this, Saga that. And it's sounding really familiar. And, there, you know, obviously it's because, you know, you look at him and you wonder... If there's some relation along the line between him and Kotaro, perhaps, maybe, definitely, possibly. And, and he's also voiced by Miano, so it's yes. like, yeah, this, this, this kind of the same character. And I mean, all our characters appear in her time as well, or at least characters who look like them, like little cameos. But it's obviously yeah. not our actual characters because they all died in different time periods. But maybe they're ancestors or something, who knows, or it's just a, you know, visual gag thing 
But yeah, he yeah. is really he is in there, and he's like, okay, this could actually be Kotaro's ancestor or mm-hmm. someone like that because they have the absolute same mindset. I, I I did like that. You know, you see the characters in the background. I thought that was a neat sort of filling out the of the background. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, Kichi's friend Ito uh, learns all about his plan for this. Ito isn't exactly on Kichi's side because a whole bunch of ex-samurais start appearing after Kichi has recruited a whole bunch of people to to his cause and there's blood. There's a lot of blood. Yeah, the show at this point suddenly gets very serious. (laughs) The atmosphere, the music, the voice acting, it's almost like a completely different show. Uh, not in a bad way. It's just like you don't didn't really expect that from Zombieland Saga, considering what you got before this. It suddenly really becomes a very, very serious period drama, where it's like, hey, here are these samurai who want to get back to the glory days of what Saga was before, who that was, you know, kind of enacted by a different province or stuff like that, and kind of lost its influence. And, st- uh, and yeah, they want to get back to the old days and... Uh, Kichi wants this all to do peacefully, right? He's mm. doing handouts and everything, and pro- making proclama- proclamations and everything, but they kind of want to go, at some point, the violent way, and they're like, yeah, this is not going to do it, and c- we have to, we're not going to tell uh, Kichi about it, because he won't agree with it. And Ito is a spy for the government, and he's like, I'm going to I'm going to cut them down. <laughs> It gets really uh, harrowing, and it gets really sad in a way, mm-hmm. and especially you know how Yugiri is, you know, woven into that story. Yeah. Yugiri basically helps uh, Kichi escape, and then she has a duel with Ito, and he more or less allows himself to be struck down out of respect for Kichi, mm-hmm. and then Yugiri is executed for Ito's death. Well, she kind of let that happen to yes. to let him escape. Like she sacrificed herself, and it's suggested he did something to help Saga get independence from uh, you know the other state again. I wonder how that really came about. Uh, 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 as far as I can tell, uh, he Kichi got to Nagasaki, and he was mm-hmm. able to submit an appeal for Saga's independence. Ah, okay, interesting. Yeah, yes, right. Um, all uh, sprinkled in there is Kichi's uh, grandfather, I think. Yes. And boy, he looks and sounds a whole lot like the bartender that Kotaro talks with very often. Mm-hmm. And also, Kichi mentions that, you know, he has some kind of ability or a special gift or something and you know it's more it feels like a throwaway line but your ears immediately perk up where it's like hmm Mm. interesting (laughs) okay okay i think it's the family line or in general it's like this family secret where it's like about uh was it just about raising the dead or was it prolonging life i don't remember it's unclear yes it's unclear if it's one the other or both Yes, they but they make very heavy allusions to that, uh, you know, where it's like, hey, yeah, this might actually be the same guy that is living at the bar right now. Right. Who, you know, has basically watched over Saga and is now has told Kotaro his story and, and found in Kotaro someone who shares the same sentiment as his grandson and uh, who now is supposed to bring Saga, who has fallen from, not from grace, but you know what I mean, they're not popular anymore, and, you know, they are about to be forgotten as a province, and now uh, Kotaro is the one who basically can fulfill Kichi's role and bring back Saga to glory, only by a slightly different method, <laughs> through idols. Mm. So, But that was, I thought that was really interesting. Did the sh- uh, change in tone bother you, uh, where it was like, oh, this is, before this, this is, Occasionally a bit more serious, but mostly just funny character antics and then idle songs and songs from the heart and everything. Uh, and then it be- that it became really serious. Was there something where you're like, eh, it doesn't really match together? Or is that where you're like, no, this is, this is fine. I this mean, is good. Given that we had sort of seen up to this point that Yugiri was a bit more stoic, I sort of, I think it worked fine to see that, yeah. you know, 
she is the way she is because she went through some shit. <laughs> yes. And again, her arc is then, you know, then culminates in her sacrificing herself and then doing basically a, a song that kind of verbalizes uh, or her journey in a way through song uh, at the end of the two-parter. And that's a good song. Mm. Like, and the parts of the performance that are in CG are nice as well. Everyone from that arc doing a little dance was neat, you know, from, from that flashback. Yeah, yeah. So I, I enjoyed it a lot. And yeah, like you said, or like we said, the old bartender might be the... What is the father or the grandfather? The grandfather of Kichi, right? Grandfather. Yeah. And he references Yuguri's past life, I think... So she either filled him in on it or he is the same character. They're still being ambiguous about it, like you said. But it was really cool. I really liked the two, uh, that two-parter. That was not something I expected from the show. I didn't expect like these two very plot-driven episodes or, or you know, plot-driven, but, you know, also character-driven mostly, but also filling us in more on what this how this world actually came to be, how these characters came to be, what was this, what I think now is the setup for the whole story. We kind of learned if we can make assumptions and they turn out to be correct, the origin of Kotaro in a way. We don't know all of Kotaro's back, Kotaro backstory yet, but we can see where he came from. We can see how the zombie thing came about. We know where Yurigi, uh, Yugiri came from. We see the parallels between uh, Saga being in a situation of peril in the Meiji era and in this era. So yeah, that was not, like a really nice, uh, really nice connection and setup to the whole thing that I did not expect. And I didn't expect the show to go into that kind of territory. Uh, storytelling wise so i really appreciated it i i thought this two-parter was great mm. and after the two-parter we finally get filled in on exactly how the disaster concept at uh efs happened yes. and what led up to it yeah that's where that's where we got the fill in that you wanted <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah we learn how the girls turned it around too like it was actually tyre that got them out of their funk i believe uh when after that shit happened right yeah no, because obviously. she was able to go out and get food at some of Kotaro's savings and she managed to put on some of the makeup not very well no <laughs> so which you know that helped inspire them to uh get their revenge mm. I that, still that... think this would have worked better as a shocking season opener, like I said at the beginning when you asked me, but here it serves as a nice contrast to how far the girls and Kotaro have come since that point. And he even apologizes to them, which is at first, I think. So mm. I think that works really well uh, in that regard. So like I said, I don't think it hurts to show that they put that in here. Might have been a better way, but I like that part uh, of showing us how this all came to be. And like I said, contrasting it with what we experienced the girls going through in the season and, you know, pulling themselves up at their bootstraps or whatever. <laughs> God, I hate that saying. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but yeah, um, at this point, Okoba confronts Kotaro with the evidence that he's accumulated. And he's basically threatening to expose his exploitation of the dead to the public. Um and that's when Kotaro speaks with the old man bartender that night. And at that point, we find out that Kotaro somehow resurrected the girls to preserve Saga's memory in the aftermath of a prophesied cataclysm. Yes. Excuse prophesied, me? Yeah, prophesied by, uh, by Kichi's grandfather, maybe, who might also be Kichi himself, really. Could be the case. We don't know. But yeah, he predicts a cataclysmic event that will make everyone forget Saga ever existed. Mm. And Kotaro ran into him 12 years ago and believed him and thus enacted his plan with the help of the immortal old man's resurrection powers that he has for some reason. So I wonder if they will go even more into that maybe in coming seasons, I'm not sure. But it's just something we have to accept for now that he could do that. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I... Yeah, because... There's a couple more episodes to cover. We'll talk about it at the end. Mm. As Okaba is about to publish his expose, there's a sudden prefecture-wide blackout in a thunderstorm that sends the girls' mansion drifting out to sea. Uh, oh, oh. That was a cliffhanger because it yeah, looks it like tsunami and then the house is sinking and then the episode ends. You're like, what the fuck is happening? Yeah. So and in in okay. regards to Okubo, just something I want to add because it maybe sounds like he's doing this a bit out of selfish reasons, maybe for 
publicity or something, but his main reason to publishing what he knows is because he thinks Kotaro is has only revived the girls to profit from them. Mm. And Kotaro is not exactly telling him, no, that's not the case, or giving him any reason to believe otherwise. He's just like, I ah, come to the concert and you will see, and I will change the fate of Saga, and, you know, his usual stuff. But Okubu, at least at that point, doesn't really believe him. So that's where we are at this point. And then that shit with the... That may be what uh, Kichi's grandfather or Kichi himself prophesized is actually happening. So big, big fucking uh, storm, maybe tsunami, uh, flooding, and a bunch of stuff destroyed and all that shit. And the whole swept to the open sea. <laughs> yeah. But yes, the mansion drifts out to, I uh, believe, the shore of Hamasaki, and then it collapses and destroys everything inside. Uh, uh, the girls are found by uh, a co-worker from I's part-time job, and they kind of all make this makeshift shelter for people who lost their homes in power. Um, and they are discovered again by Okoba, who is secretly observing them as they are basically uh, each night kind of putting on many performances for the children, trying to keep mm -hmm. their spirits up. Um and he sort of, Okaba sort of slowly comes to the realization that, hey, they're just kind of doing this on their own. Yeah, exactly. It's them who wants, who want that, who want that, who want to do that performance and to want to be uh, idols and to want to bring happiness to the children, to Saga in general and everything. It's not Kotaro that is making them do it. Mm. And that's kind of his turnaround point where it's like, oh, okay. Oh, okay, I get it now. And there's this scene... I mean, they, they don't only put up performance, they also help out in the shelter in general, like, mm. you know, with the food and uh, everything and, you know, uh, cleaning up and all that stuff. So that's really nice. But yeah, like you said, mainly it's they're putting on performances, uh, keeping... The sp to lift the spirits of everyone because, of course, everyone is pretty down, especially the people who lost their homes and especially the kids. So, yeah, they make that. And do you do... Makeup malfunction. <laughs> oh no! They get outed as zombies, but no one believes they're actually zombies. Yeah, and it doesn't matter because the kids love them anyway. Yeah, because they are like we're zombies, and it's like no, the kids like who cares? Just like my mind did, and it's a heartwarming scene. It's really nice. The kids don't care. They love Front Shushu. They're like, who cares? I don't care. Zom you you're not zombies, or you're not those kind of zombies. You're nice zombies. You you don't. Bite, you don't eat other people you you, you sing a lovely song so i don't give a shit <laughs> so that's yeah that was a really nice scene and the girls get like accepted basically by everyone yeah of course the parents don't believe it but the kids are like yeah we believe it but we don't care so yeah it's, it's really nice <laughs> mm. uh that's when uh right Kotaro and the bartender are stranded in the flooded bar and there's this we didn't talk about this character. There's this like dumbass police officer. He was already the, in the first season, yeah. Yeah, but you know, we didn't talk about him yet. Uh, mm -hmm. He who ends up finding Kotaro and the old man and helping uh, get them out of there. Uh, the bartender is hospitalized, and that's when Kotaro reunites uh, with the girls, uh, helps them with their makeup again, and tells them that their revenge concert is still on schedule. Soccer and he have this uh, heartfelt moment where she's like, you know, thank you for helping us achieve our dream. And Kotaro says, you know, hey, I'm going to continue to support you until you become world famous. And it's 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 a great moment. Yes, it's a really nice heart to heart between Kotaro and Sakura and everything. And you you get the feeling that he had some experience in his life when he was younger that made him do that. They kind of always do a kind of callback to that, but you don't know exactly yet what happened there That's that spurned him to do that. Maybe he knew one of the idols, he knew that they, you know, he was in love with one of them and they died or something. I assume if they fill us in on that, it's going to happen in third season. They don't mm. do that in this one. But you can always get it, like, there's a very specific and heartfelt reason for Kotoro to do all of that. And it's not only to bring back happiness to Saga, Maybe Sakura is the reason. You don't know, but or he sees someone in Sakura that he lost or something, right? Mm. So we'll we'll see if we get to that, uh, if we get another season or stuff like that. But it's, yeah, that moment was really nice and I enjoyed it a lot. It was really heartfelt and cool. 
And I'm um, glad the show doesn't only rely on its comedy antics, but does some really solid character stuff and character moments and makes even someone like Kotaro endearing uh, at certain points mm. <laughs> during its runtime. And yeah, it's it's really nice just in general that scene. I mean, that all leads eventually to the big performance right mm. uh in in the stadium but we have, there's some parts getting there like with the shelter and everything and like you said the heart to heart um i thought uh just as a quick side note the which is also one of you know this sh- sh- uh, season has a lot more serious tones in between and you know that was the stuff with Yugi, yugiri's past and then there's this like when the when the disaster hits when saga gets flooded like the flooding damage is portrayed pretty meticulously mm. in the show's environment like the the moment like the scenes where the girls travel back from nagaseki to uh to the you know to saga and to the shelter and uh you, you see them walking through the uh through the wrecked environments and everything it was just really somber and like oof, okay this feels real this feels like this could be, you know, after some a disaster like that, a natural disaster actually occurred. And it makes you feel for the people who, who are in the shelter even more because you see the damage that's, that was done. And I thought that was, was done really well and like a really nice, somber, serious moment in this show uh, that I also didn't expect. So I liked it. Mm. And I thought that was that was really great. But yeah, then... We uh, get to the Wicked Concert, I guess. And it's, yeah, I want to tell us about it, John. <laughs> I mean, uh, Okaba and Kotaro basically convinced the governor of Saga to, to focus their efforts around uh, Tosu, where the stadium is, so that Fran Shushu could put on their show. And they basically turn into a charity concert. Yes, and they make this, like, this, this big announcement through the radio and everything to get the people over there kind of or let that let them know that that the concert is still on right mm. i think that's how they do it and it's nice to see all the characters from earlier episodes during the radio show and it gets very emotional when they arrive in stride to the concert to support Fran shushu i thought that was also a really well done scene mm. they had their i guess it was as as close to an actual concert as you could have because they performed three songs in a row mm. um what, you you have something to say <sighs> i'm listen i'm going to say this the cg at the start of the show is rough but i really honestly truly think it got a lot better as it went on that's true <laughs> But it's still CG, John. I know, I know. And we have seen parts of the season again. We know what it looks like when it's done really well traditionally animated. So I can't help but compare it to that. I know, I know. I, 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 got, I, I know, I know. I don't want to bring the mood down because <laughs> so far this has been a really positive review overall. But I, sadly, I thought the final concert kind of sucked. Aww, <laughs> ah. The songs are all right, but none of the tracks like knocked me off my feet, like the performance of Yuguri did, or the one in the um, the episode uh, with Ryu. And like you said, uh, the performance, all of the performances, all three songs, they're all done in CG with some incredibly standard camera work. And I thought the costumes were kind of boring too in terms of design. And there is. You know, after we got, like, this really big thing, you know, now there's a concert, there's no really any additional cathartic storytelling outside of the songs themselves, which, yeah, in the lyrics and everything, it's in there. It's just like, hey, this is how far we've come, and this is our moment and everything, so that works. But I was so distracted by the lackluster visuals, I did not pay attention that much to the lyrics, and that's not supposed to happen. (laughs) It's not the worst the show has looked before, but it's most definitely not the best. Like, if you compare it to, like I said, to the performance in, uh, you know, in the uh, the performance in the Ryu episode, if you compare it to the performance uh, in the Rap Battle episode in the first season, or the first, first concert at Giles, all of that looked great and much better than this. And I said the same thing about the final concert in the first season. It's like, why don't you save some of your budget and time, whatever, and manpower for the final performance of this thing, of the season? This is the big finale. And this is an even bigger finale. 
this is a bigger finale to a lot of plot and character storylines than in the first season. So they should have saved up some of what they had for this show, be it manpower or budget or whatever, and should have pulled out all the stops for that performance. Again, same as Final Fantasy 1, just on a grander scale and more disappointing in that regard. And I, I'm pretty sure you liked it, right? I, you, you were I at least enjoyed with it. it. Yeah? yeah, I mean, that's that's great. That's fantastic. And I would have liked to have felt the same. It was just like, there was so much built up for this. And well done built up. Really well done built up for this concert. It was so great. What we what the characters went through in the season. And, you know, the, the discoveries they had, their arcs they had, the people they met, and who they influenced, and so on. Like you said, the great uh, thing between Kotaro and Sakura and all that stuff. It was all really, really good stuff. Good storytelling. It was funny. It was engaging, endearing. And I would have liked to have like this great exclamation point in the form of a really good looking concert. And I feel like I didn't get that. So that was that was a tad disappointing to me, I gotta say. And that's a bummer. But nah. you know, if if you liked it, that's that's great. And I'm happy for you. I mean, we don't have to feel the same about things, and you're more enamored with idle stuff in general, I think. So I think that's. Uh, I'm glad that if that something in the genre you really enjoy d did work really well for you. So that's cool. I mean, idle stuff is neat, but the idle industry is a fucking wasteland. Number one. Yes. Number two. There's so much of it that's hit or miss. If I'm pretty sure I've said it before. If your name isn't the Idol Master or Love Live, you you have to come out strong. Yes. And, and to be fair, Zombie Land Saga is doing still something very different from those shows. Yes. It's doing what it can with what it's got. And I yes. I don't know. I think even if you don't like the performances, it's got a whole lot of other great stuff to it. Absolutely. I stuck with it because of the character development. I thought the characters in the show are fantastic. Mm. They're really enjoyable, they're funny, they're like I said, adorable and, and lovable, like it's the girls of course, but also Kotaro, you know, once you can learn to deal with <laughs> me the person, Mamoru Miano, uh, at his Mianoist. Uh, <laughs> Then you have a good time. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed all the characters. I enjoyed the character stories. I enjoyed the more serious tones of the season a lot. I hope we will, if there is a third season, and we might get one considering how this season ends, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is a fucking weird cliffhanger. But yeah, I hope we will get more of those as well. And yeah, I, I like basically everything about that show except for the weird. It's just, it's a very nice parallel to, to fucking Megalobox. I like everything about this, uh, about these two shows except for the fucking, you know, setup basically for the, for the thing that you, that you identify with them. One, it's a boxing show where I don't like the boxing and the other one is an idol show where I don't really like the song performances all that much. So it's, it's really funny. It's really funny. I guess I don't go to these shows for what they are actually uh, promoting to be. <laughs> hey, and you know so, what though? That's fine if you can find yeah. something else in it though. Yeah, so uh, the, <laughs> it's, it's funny that we have the sparrow there. I didn't think about that that by, when I matched the reviews for both of these shows, but that works out. <laughs> in, at least in that regard, that's that's really funny. But anyway, yeah, I you you mentioned the um, idol industry in real life being really fucked, and you know, initially, I that's what I wanted from Zombie Land Saga to be more of a mean spirited thing that took jabs at that industry and showed you the dark underbelly and everything and criticized it and be more cynical about it and everything. But that was already clear from the very from the first season very quickly that that is not what the show is about. Mm. This is a hopeful show about again regrets or you know uh, certain goals trying to get somewhere, making friends and all that, working through problems and all that stuff and finding the road to an optimistic future, what have you. Right. Uh, and yeah, so that's what, what the show does and what that show does with its characters. It's a very hopeful show in the face of adversity. And that's cool. That's really cool. It's not what I expected or wanted from the show initially, but I'm fine with it doing that. The only thing, you know, I don't like about the show occasionally uh, are the performances. And like I said, there are some in there that I really like. So it's a minor problem. It's a really, really minor problem. And I would still recommend this show 
if you're not completely against musical styled stuff because there of course there are a lot of songs in there and some of the stuff that happens in the show is very cheesy in a way <laughs> you know very earnest in regards to uh, what it does with its emotional high points and stuff like that so if you can deal with that i think you will enjoy the show i did and and you you definitely did john so yes um yeah. but we didn't really touch on the very end did we no, not yet. So, before the girls go back out on stage for their encore, which, by the way, the performance is a smashing success, mm -hmm. um, Kotaro congratulates all the girls, but tells them that Saga has still yet to be saved. And as they run back out on stage, he hides that he was coughing up blood onto the mm -hmm. floor. Hmm. And this leads me to some of my questions from earlier. I wonder, is Kotaro just Kichi? Maybe. I wonder if if he's been alive all these these centuries, or if he's was brought back by the uh the immortal old man who may or may not be his grandfather from two hundred something years ago. Like these just were too many questions. God damn it. And then <laughs> after that, after the credit roll, we see this Independence Day style scene where there's this flying saucer that just nukes some part of the landscape. I guess it's time for our Saga Pendant Day. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Is that <laughs> part of the prophesied calamity? I mean, that's that's that was the climax of One Punch Man season one. That was great. So who knows? Uh, I don't. Uh, yeah, aliens might be coming, and now they have to perform a concert to impress the alien overlords or something and save the Earth. Who knows what will happen next? It will be really interesting to see. I hope we'll get this third season. That has not been really confirmed yet. They have so, to after that. They fucking yes, have to. It would be really mean if they now didn't... After, you know, there wasn't such a big tease at the end of the first season, but now at the end of the second season, going out with this really wild-as-fuck cliffhanger... This, I mean, there have been, of course, there are super, uh, supernatural elements in the show, but this is kind of a completely different ballpark, mm -hmm. just suddenly throwing aliens in there. And yeah, who who, who knows? And in regards to your theories about uh, Kotaro, yeah, he might be Kichi, he might be a zombie himself. Remember, he can he is the guy who can do the perfect makeup and everything. Mm. So he might have been resurrected by the old man, but not uh, Kichi himself, but maybe someone that the old man reminded him of. And uh, maybe he uh, died in his old life and also has some regrets, but for some reason, was helped by a different person or stuff like that, maybe by an idol. I don't fucking know. I hope we'll get answers to all of this in the next season, and I hope we get one. Yeah. <laughs> one of the many reasons why I hope we'll get one. There's still a lot of mysteries here that have not been answered. Who is Tai? She might also be, be related to what Kotaro's motivation is. That might be the case, mm. why he's not telling them about her. Might all be, And she is always taking center stage. And she is... Zero. She's the very first, kind of. Right. So that sounds like she is the keystone, the, the, the thing where all of this started with. And that would mean that she is the, the reason behind why Kotaro is doing it, probably. So I wonder if that is what this is leading to and if we get answers to that in the third season. I hope so. Mm -hmm. I really hope so, because there are some good mysteries in here and I would like the answers to that and I hope we get them. So we'll see. We can only hope. And I mean, this has been a hopeful show, so let's let's try to share that sentiment. and Give us what we want, Psy Games. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, is Psy Games responsible for that? I yeah. thought this was a MAPPA thing only. I mean, yes, it is. The animation is produced by MAPPA, but I believe the IP belongs to Psy Games. Oh, really? Okay. Interesting. Yeah, then probably. I mean, Psy Games has a bunch of money to throw around, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that this, <laughs> all, there will be more than... All of that Grand Blue and Uma Musume money. Holy shit. I mean, people like the second season, and uh, I assume there's a lot of merchandise that can be sold from the show, so... Oh, yeah. I... I would be surprised if, if we don't get a third season for this. Mm. I mean, it's a bit out there compared to other idol shows. And like you said, if you have stuff like Idol Master and Love Life, you have to fight hard to gain Gala more interest. But I think I think there are probably enough people that are interested in this show. I, of course, ratings-wise, I have no idea how the show did. But I would be surprised if it didn't do well enough to merit a third season, especially if Psygames are the one bankrolling it. So 
uh, let's be hopeful for now. Let's see that we get another chapter in this story. Hopefully the final one. So we get a really good conclusion to all of this and finally get a book on Dan Kotaro's story and learn more about Ty and everything. Because everything el everyone else kind of is a at a point. Well, maybe Sakura. But also she, I think, had her big turnaround in the season, I guess, mm -hmm. in a way. So I think all we need really at this point is a story about uh, the story of Ty and uh, of Kotaro to be finished up. And I think you can do that in another season. So yeah. let's see what happens. Let's see what happens with them, with them fucking aliens. <laughs> uh, <laughs> God damn it. Yeah. A side note, one last funny bit that made me laugh. Ty sneezing at the final concert and the crowd interpreting it as she's saying front choo choo. Aces. Top joke. Top joke. Um. Fantastic. I just want to throw out there on that. That is probably the pinnacle of one Kotono Mitsui she's voice acting career. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, not probably. true. That's absolutely not true. <laughs> she, she put herself into that. and It was fucking great. Let's say it was one of the high points of her career. Yeah. <laughs> I think she can live with that if we, if we, if we say that about it. So yeah, I thought Zombieland's uh, Saga Revenge was a really, really fun show. If you are not into idol stuff, still try to give it a chance. I think it's worth it for the character development and everything and for some nice twists and turns here. And, you know, if you're not a fan of the performances like I am in general uh, or for the most part, don't be scared off because, in my opinion, there's enough in that show that merits a watch regardless. And if you're more dialed into that and if you don't mind the CG so much then you will have a good time uh, with the performances as well and with the show over uh, uh, in general as the whole package. Mm. So then that's even more reason to check it out. So yeah, I thought it was great and I got the impression that John, you felt the same. <laughs> I, I thoroughly enjoyed it beginning to end. Oh, we haven't talked about the fantastic second opening. Oh, ah, no, we did. oh. my miss. Mm. Well, you mentioned at the very beginning about the mm -hmm. roadblocks and I didn't put two and two together that that's what they were going for with this opening sequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and oh, there's, there's a lot of good shit in the, the, the new opening song is fantastic. I, yes. I believe it's Osaga cry with me is the trans yes. name. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of neat visual things in there. Like I think one of my favorite ones is when the girls are in the van driving down the street and you see the letters for the word stop falling from mm -hmm. the sky and the camera goes through the van that's yeah that's really good i, I think my favorite moment is when the actual um chorus sets in and they are in the fighter jets and stuff that's a, also a really really cool moment just in terms of how the song works together with the with the scene and i think it's sakura who has like this prolonged note that she holds where it's like ah and then you know they uh they they get into the chorus and it's really really cool uh i really enjoyed it. i thought that's like i like that second song even more than the first one i gotta say yeah i thought that yeah. second opening is fantastic uh it's interesting because the uh the the version of it that's on the single the uh opening narration part where sakura is just talking that's on the song the part mm. that they did that with in the first opening song that's not on the single which is weird yeah that's interesting it's, i kind of like it better with you know the narration at the beginning of it you know it's just sort of setting it's up nice stakes meeting. for this song yeah exactly it's like okay this is what's gonna happen and i mean it's a nice it's, it's kind of like if you if you listen to the songs back to back it's kind of like a nice bridge uh, leading from one song into the next and then you because those those ops are kind of also like stories that tell you what this each respective season is about so after this you know what the first season is about the, the first op telling you about it and then and then having the narration by sakura telling you no we we got cast down into hell again but we're ready to fight back and have our revenge so that's like like you said a nice setup and a nice lead into to to the second op that tells you more about that mm. so i feel like it's appropriate that there's like this this small part like i said if you listen back to back to both ops small part of of interjected dialogue in between that kind of separates these songs but also acts like a connection so i thought I, if it feels like that they thought that through and that's why they left that narration in there for the second OP because it's kind of like a two-part song. And maybe we'll get another narration in the op uh, third OP if we get a third season. So I hope that so. would kind of work as well. Yeah, would be would be really cool. I wonder, I don't think anything can top the second OP for me, but uh, we'll see, we'll see. I'll, uh, I'll let them try. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. 
good ass show. Ah, just it's so weird because this show basically came from nothing, and now it's mm-hmm. like the it might be the next big uh, like contender in the idol space, as far as we can tell, anyway. But if you were interested in checking out Zombieland Saga, you can watch it fucking everywhere. Jesus. It's on Crunchyroll and their partner, Verve. Uh, it's, they're rolling out uh, the second season of the dub on Funimation right now. The first season is all on there. I think as of this recording, the third episode is up on there. Uh, you can watch it on Apple TV of all places. What the hell? Yeah. And if you live outside, you know, the U.S. or Europe, I guess it's on like Muse, Anime Lab, Anime On Demand. So there's no shortage of places to find this show to watch it. It's great. Y'all should check it out. It's on Crunchyroll over here. And I forgot to tell people where they can watch Megalobox. That's, I think, on Funimation in the U.S. and uh, on Hulu, maybe. And over here, it's on Wakanim. So, yeah, definitely check that out, too. But, yeah, uh, Crunchyroll, uh, Crunchyroll, <laughs> Zombieland Saga Revenge is everywhere. So, uh, you can, yeah, you, you'll find it if you want to. And uh, you'll find Megalobox, too. Two great shows. Uh, you should you should check those out, definitely. And remember, keep your head on straight. <laughs> <laughs> you bastard. And that is a wrap on the 116th episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our show is from the Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jack Kaufman. Please go to virt.bandcamp.com and check out his awesome work. Our show is available on most of the popular podcast services, but it's always worth visiting animebrainfreeze.com for our review index and more. Leave us comments and questions on YouTube, follow us on Twitter at AnyBrainFreeze, or send an email to animebrainfreeze at gmail.com. We would love to read your feedback. Thanks for tuning in, we hope you had a good time, and please join us again on our next episode. Macht's gut? So long, everybody. Next time on Anime Brain Freeze. Local village idiot destroys town, saves world. And the most terrifying monster is regret. Regret.